Let's introduce our next speaker. Okay, our next speaker is Nick Humrick, who is a cloud architect and developer experience advocate. He has been obsessing with DevOps and DevX or DX practices for 10 years, has a passion for highly stable distributed systems and architectures, which he started when he worked at AWS and helped build Elastic Beanstalk. He's a former engineer at FamilySearch, AWS, Canopy, Hivewire, and Lendio. He is currently the CTO at a software startup, Insymmetry. Dude, I totally botched that. I'm so sorry. Insymmetry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, there you go. You just did a, an accidental case study in pronunciation. All right. That was my bad. OK. Uh, his title is The Eventful API Rethinking Front End State from the Server Down. Please welcome Nick Sumrick. So the other day, uh, I came home, and my wife showed me that there was a squeaky door in the house. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to fix a squeaky door, but I made a software estimate, right, and said that should take me about three minutes. Well, what happened was I realized I didn't have any graphite, so I had to go to the store, buy some graphite, came home, thought I fixed the squeaky door, and then I noticed that the latch on the door was also not quite working. So I had to go back to the store, get a brand new latch, come back, fix the latch, and then I realized there's something a little wrong with the door. I need a little chisel to like cut away a little bit of wood. Go grab my chisel. It's not there. Go to my office. Things are a mess. I have to clean up my office. You get the idea, right? Like I went to go fix a squeaky door. Next thing you know, I'm three hours in doing all sorts of other things for my three minute door fix. This to me is a lot what I feel like when I work with front end state. I feel like I go update one thing, and next thing you know, I'm updating everything else just to try to get all of it to work. So today what we're going to do is we're going to do a really simple to-do app, because everyone knows the only thing you build in JavaScript is to-do apps, right? It's pretty much the only thing. Um, but we're going to build one together. We're going to kind of watch this kind of grow together. So this is our to-do app that we're going to do. And this is the code that, like, when you mark a task as completed, you're going to get this code. It's not very complex. You then hit the API, you mark it as completed, and then you update the state for the tasks on the page. But then your product manager comes to you and says, hold up, we forgot something. We now need to add in this progress bar, right? So you now need to update the code to not only update the task list, but you also need to update the progress bar. You feel pretty good about this code. And then, sure enough, more specs come along, and you realize there's even more that you need to add to your page. So now we have the leaderboard, and we have the team page, and we need to make sure that we update those. And so our code now, we're updating all sorts of things. And so now, even though we're just updating the task and marketing is completed, we now have to basically force four more components to update. Now, you could do this really simple, because this is just a to-do app. But the idea is, imagine that there's state that the server knows about that the front end does not necessarily know about. So you have to ask the back end server for that state whenever you do a component updates. And this is not ideal. So now, one more requirement. Now there's a delete button on all the tasks because you can delete the task. And so we write the code for the delete task. And we can see that the code looks almost exactly the same as the code for a complete task. We still need to update all the state and all the components. And there's lots of solutions to solve these things. But the general idea is this feels wrong. And the reason that it feels wrong is because you're actually violating a very high level principle, which is called loose coupling and high cohesion. The main idea being that cohesion, um, cohesion represents objects that are supposed to live together that kind of do one thing. The concept actually comes from like biology and cells talking about things that work together and act together. So a highly cohesive unit is one where everything in that unit works together. And then the other side is coupling. And coupling represents when multiple components 
require the other component or a piece of that other component to work correctly. So in this case, our task component was required to update the state on our other components, and so that's tight coupling. And so my kind of rule of thumb to know if you're loosely coupled and highly cohesive is what changes together lives together. That's like my mantra that I tell myself. If you find yourself trying to make a change to something and you find yourself always having to touch three or four different files to make a change, you probably don't have high cohesion. Likewise, if you find yourself finding one spot of code that you're always updating anytime you update anything else, that's tight coupling and you should probably try to get rid of that. So there's other solutions to fix this. One solution is GraphQL, which instead of us having to go get the state from the server on all these different things, we can make, we can make a GraphQL request. Well, the problem is I've made this GraphQL request, but I still don't know anything about the components that need to be updated. So then you can make a subsequent request to get the state of all the things. Now, we've definitely eliminated the network traffic here. We're now making one request as opposed to one per component. But the code isn't really actually changing. We've just moved the needle to be inside that component to now be in the GraphQL module. Every time I add a feature or a component, I still have to go in and I have to change my GraphQL to add in the new state so that the request gets it. Another common pattern is using Redux. We can use Redux to you know, add some dispatchers and reducers and try to get state to work. That actually feels really good when you're talking about high cohesion loose coupling because your components are no longer coupled. I no longer have to tell my task component to update the state of all the other components. It actually feels way more natural and it is better. But the downside here is you are still tightly coupled to the implementation of the backend. And what I mean by that is the backend already knows the dependencies between these modules. It already knows that when a task gets completed, something else also updates, and it has to go and do all of those updates. And you are now re-implementing all that business logic on the front end. So every time you add a component, you're re-implementing the idea of, okay, when this changes, what other things on the page can change? What other things in the entire system can change? And how do you grapple with that? So while Redux does f make this better from a front-end perspective, you're still doing that from the back-end perspective. Then you also have the React um, context API. And it's very similar. You're no longer prop drilling. You're no longer intentionally updating components but you still have the problem of you have to declare the context upon which everything lives and you have to get it right. And so this common solution to solving these problems in distributed systems is a concept called orchestration versus choreography. The idea here is that if you ever play in an orchestra, you have to watch the conductor. The conductor might choose to slow everyone down or he might speed everyone up he might tell you to play really soft or really loud. And so he controls everything going on. And so orchestration is the idea that you have one module or component or something that is deciding everything else that is gonna happen. And in these examples, that's essentially what we have. We've had a, our task list and it's complete. Every time a task is marked as completed, it then orchestrates the fact that all the other components have to update. Now, alternatively to orchestration is the concept of choreography. And imagine that you're in a dance and you're on stage and you're doing your dance. What you're doing is not gonna be the same as what the person next to you might be doing. And you're not taking instructions from anyone. You're listening to the music, you're paying attention to your surroundings, and you're doing the things that you have been instructed to do. So that's the concept of orchestration. And again, I have a little mantra for myself that helps me remember these things, and that's stop commanding and start listening. It's also good life advice, by the way. Um, so in traditional REST model, your backend is, you're gonna send a request to your backend and say, hey, I have marked this task as complete. 
Then the back end comes back and says, OK, here's your task. Well, yeah, I know, right? I just told you what it was. And so I always found it weird that the back end is telling you the state that you just gave it. This response from the back end when you mutate state, it's meaningless. It solves no point. It doesn't give you anything that you need to know. Everything you need to know is in the response code, that 200. OK, I did it. You're done. I know what you want. So instead, what we can do is instead of returning the object back, because it doesn't really provide value, instead, the back end can return events, all the things that have happened because of your request. And instead, and one of those could be the update that you just made. But now you know everything in the system that has changed because of your request, rather than the one object that you intentionally changed. And so you might have issues if you go to your backend engineers and say, hey, can we return events? Because you might have APIs, like public APIs, that your customers use that are expecting the traditional REST pattern. There's a concept called backends for frontends where you should have a backend response specifically for the type of frontend that you're doing. That means you could have a backend for your mobile, backend for your frontend web component, a backend for your public API. So if you have a public API and you're not able to return events on your public API, you could always create a front-end version just for the front-end web component or for the mobile component that does do this eventing system. So if we, if we were to re-implement this logic in our using the event system in our task list, essentially it would look like this. We would have our components. And when we complete a task, we would then make the request as normal. That request would return some events, and so we would call a generic function to process those events. Then somewhere else, like on the stats page, we would listen to those events, and you would specifically say which events you want to listen for. So in this case, when you write the stats panel, it says any event that has statistics or progress in it, I want to listen to those and decide myself if I want to update my own component. And then every component that you build from then on out doesn't need to know anything. So if we added our delete task at this point, we would add our delete component, we would then process the events, and every other component that changed would naturally update itself because it was already listening to the correct events. So we have high cohesion, because we only need to update one thing, and that's the component we're actually worrying about. And we have loose coupling, because components don't need to know about each other. In fact, they don't even pass state between each other. The, the actual front end portion of this, outside of the components, you just call the components. There's no state being passed. They don't need to know about each other at all, because all their communication happens via these events, which can come directly from the back end. So on the back end, if you're implementing this yourself, uh, one example of how to do this, if you were using um, Express, for example, is you could write a middleware. And that middleware could add some functions to the request. It could add an events object to the request. And it could add this emit, this emit function to the request. And then whenever you return a JSON response, it re attaches the events to that response every single time. And so what that would look like in your actual handler is you would do your normal handling, and then you call request emit any time you have a new event that you want to add to your event store. And if you can do this as deep as you want, and you can propagate these events, and you can go through. And then when you return to your JSON, eventually the front end gets a list of all the things and all the side effects that have happened. So what do you do then with these events? Well, in the, in the example I gave, we were using Tanstack query, and you can listen to the, the events object on your JSON. But you could also put them on the window. Um, you could just call dispatch event, and each component could listen. They could have their own event listener to different things. You could write some, um, some concept where each component registers itself as an event listener. There's lots of different solutions and things you can do. But you can, 
you can pass these events through the, um, to the components rather than passing state between components. And if you do this, it actually makes testing your components easier as well because your components no longer need any initial state to test. You just publish a fake event and then watch what it does based on that fake event. And in this example, we were getting the events from the JSON object, but there's actually multiple ways that you could receive these events. Um, you could get it as a response object on your JSON, like we showed. You could also use WebSockets or server set events to have a single channel that's open sending you events all the time. If you have any multiplayer component where you maybe want to update a component when someone else did something, this is also a really great way to do that because you could plug that event into your normal system, handle it that way. You could also do what I call multi-stream server sent events. Essentially what that is, is you send one request to the back end and then it sends one event back, but it keeps the server sent event stream open and it can send more events as well, and then it closes once it's done with that request. So essentially, instead of having a JSON object where all the events have to fill that JSON object before you process the return, you can have a server send event where one event comes in, the front end starts processing it, and then more events come in and you can process those, and then the back end can say, okay, I'm done with this request, I've processed all the events. This is really useful if you have some side effects that are processed potentially out of band on the back end, like they take maybe two seconds or even 10 seconds longer. And so you could start to process some of them and wait for the others. And then the last I say is hybrid, which is really you could plug and play all of these. So imagine that you're doing events over JSON and then you decide you wanna start handling out of band events because you have um, you want to introduce a multiplayer effect to your component, then you could have some events come from your server set events and other events come from your JSON. And it doesn't matter. They all plug in and they all eventually go to the same place. So the, the biggest caveat to doing this, however, is race conditions. There's always a possibility that you receive your events out of order, especially if you're receiving them from multiple event streams, you could receive them cross order. And there's two common ways to solve this. One is you use timestamps, but if you use timestamps, you have to make sure you're using the timestamp from your transactional database. If you don't have a transactional database, this probably isn't enough. But an example of a race condition is let's say you have a user who updates their name to Billy and then updates their name to Fred. And if you receive those out of order, you now think the user's name is Billy instead of Fred. So the order of those will matter. So you need to make sure to either use the timestamps that the backend transactional um, database gives you, or you can use a pattern called the coat check pattern. Coat check pattern essentially says when I receive an event, I don't trust the data in the event, I just use this as a trigger. And then I go back to the backend and say, what's the actual state for this object? Kind of like you have a ticket for your coat, you hand it to the coat person and they give you the coat back. That does increase network, network traffic quite a bit, but at least you know that you have the updated state. And so I'll just say it one more time, if you want better events on your front end, you wanna stop commanding and start listening. Thank you. <laughs>